Hi everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology and today I'm hanging out with my friend Kat Nelligan. She has a really cool podcast called The Creative Introvert. You can check her out at thecreativeintrovert.com. Um, Kat has been helping me with my social media for like the past year and we're doing a series of basically Q&A interviews. We thought it'd be fun to talk. Uh, she has been um, uh, gathering questions from the comment section of my YouTube and trying to put together some uh, basic you know, kind of questions that a lot of people seem to have, have asked over a period of time. So in today's interview, we're going to be talking about uh, some, well, I'll let you talk, to, I'll let you tell what we're talking about today, Kat. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to be looking at the differences between Hellenistic, um, more traditional or ancient astrology versus modern astrology. Okay, great. Yeah, this is a question that a lot, I mean, lots of people have these questions. So I'm really happy to try to answer the questions people have. So what are we, what kinds of questions have been coming through? Well, I guess the first question is something about what does Hellenistic even mean? Um, what does that refer to? And is that even the right term to use? Yeah, yeah, good question. So yeah, because I refer to it all the time in my videos. And of course, people are probably asking like, well, what is it? Um, so Hellenistic astrology is the uh, when we, so we talk about horoscopic astrology. That means the the casting of a birth chart for the moment of birth from a set time and, and location of birth, and on the on, you know on the, the date, time, location of birth is configured, and then the chart is cast, and the horoscopos, the the ascendant marker, the sign and degree of the sign that's rising in the east, marks out the arrangement of the whole chart. And then that chart is broken up into 12 houses and the signs configure with those houses and the planets in those signs and houses relate to one another through aspects. And all of that is read as a kind of divinatory picture of the destiny of an, an individual, a, a birth. A, and that's what we call a birth chart. So horoscopic astrology is really, really ancient, right? It's uh, It goes back all the way to you know, we, we know that the birth charts of kings and leaders were being looked at in different ways um, very long time ago. But when we start to see this system of 12 signs, houses, aspects, planets, an ascendant, and so forth, that's what we call horoscopic astrology. And the birth of that is the last 500 years BCE, at the time when the um, rise of the Roman Empire was happening, uh, coinciding roughly with Alexander the Great's sort of world conquest and so forth. Um, and that, sometimes it's called Greco-Roman astrology or Greek astrology, or um, it's referred to as Hellenistic astrology because they call that period the Hellenistic period. It was a Greek-speaking world, but not necessarily ethnically Greek, which is an important point that many Hellenistic astrologers make because uh, what we're trying to do is refer to the, the practice of natal birth chart astrology that was in use in that, in that part of the world for a long time, all the way up until basically the decline of the Roman Empire, and that, at which point it kind of, it, it, it kind of migrates a little bit uh, to, um, to other cultures. But at any rate, that is the birth era of horoscopic natal astrology. And so when we say we practice Hellenistic astrology, what we're saying is that uh, we study the source texts, basically like your astrology textbooks from that era, and we practice astrology according to the rules, methods, techniques, and underlying metaphysics and spiritual philosophy that the astrologers were using back then. And of course, like today, there were many techniques and they weren't all being used by all astrologers. You have a toolkit. And there were um, mostly very similar spiritual philosophies, but there are you know, some choices as well. You have yogis practicing astrology in India with the same basic technology, but it's being uh, pushed through the lens of the Vedas and uh, you know, yoga philosophy and so forth. Uh, in the West, uh, you know, the Greco-Roman gods are being used, but you have Orphics, Pythagoreans, Platonists, um, you have Aristotelians, you have um, you know, Stoics. Uh, Christians, even um, Gnostics, so many different groups that end up using astrology. So astrology is this kind of, um, you know, it's a language that's really accessible for for everyone. But in the ancient world, there were very specific forms of practice. And compared to today, for example, where you have almost more of each astrologer does things in a very individual way, and their personalities have a lot more to do with the way they express or, or do astrology. In the ancient world, it was a bit more of like a science that was practiced across the board in more similar manner than it is today, where it's more, more idiosyncratic. 
So that's a basic definition. I'm not sure how helpful that is, but no, very helpful. And of course, this is a huge topic. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could kind of really briefly outline some of the core technical differences that we see uh, today. Right. Yeah. So um, there's so many, so it's really hard to summarize, but like one would be that ancient astrologers um, mostly in order to delineate the topics of a person's life, like marriage, money, career, family, et cetera, used um, what was called the, we call it now a whole sign house system. It wasn't called a house system at all back then because it was just, that was just what they did. So what that means is that whatever sign is rising at birth, that sign becomes the entirety of your first house. The next sign in zodiacal order that would rise would become the next whole sign house. So if you're like, I'm a Taurus rising, that's my whole first house. Then Gemini is my whole second house, right? Then Cancer is my whole third, Leo my whole fourth, Virgo my whole fifth, around the wheel like that. So you don't have, uh, the, the sky isn't being divided in a way that cuts up the signs into different bits as it comes to be much later in astrology. Now there are some quadrant-based house forms of division that are used in ancient astrology, but they have very specific uses. And on the whole, whole sign houses was the, you know, that was the predominant house system. It's much easier. It's more intuitive. I like to tell people, you know, think if you have a tarot spread and you have 12 cards in a circular tarot spread. In modern astrology, what we're doing is we're basically overlapping one half of one card into one position while the other half of a card is in the same position. But really one card should be in each position. Let's say one position in the circular spread represents children and the other represents health or whatever. It's a little bit more awkward and difficult to interpret when you have, you know, the sun card and the six of cups pouring over into the same space. Um, not impossible, of course, than it is when you have just a more organized one card per position, per topical position. So ancient astrology is just a little bit more clear and um, easier and simpler to look at uh, in, in that sense. Now, there's a really deep conversation that accompanies this, so I'm just simplifying it. But that's probably one of the biggest differences that people have to get used to, especially because people really like their birth charts. They're like, oh, I really like my birth chart like this. And, you know, but I, I personally believe whole sign houses are about 10 times more accurate than any other form of house division. Um, there's other technical differences like the planets that are used. Um, we have a very, very different understanding of the nodes of the moon in ancient astrology than modern evolutionary astrology, radically different. Um, we use things like the lot of fortune and the lot of spirit. We use only the traditional seven planets. Though people like myself who do a lot of crossovers with modern astrology will still use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. In my first year class, for example, I encourage all of my students to not use the outer planets for like a whole year. It's like a elimination diet. If you want to figure out you know, like if you were allergic to something and you want to figure out what's causing it, you have to eliminate things from the diet and then you are able to see clearly what's causing what to happen. So similarly, most people don't understand how rich and sophisticated the language of the traditional seven planets was based on a huge range of technical um, uh, modifications that happen in ancient astrology. And so a lot of the times people will sort of lean very heavily on the outer planets, not recognizing how much the inner planets are already saying the same thing in the chart. So we remove the outer planets in ancient astrology. And though people like myself still use them all the time, um, you know, for years now, I have not used the traditional seven for more than a couple of very, or um, I use the traditional seven and I only use the outer planets for very specific purposes. So it's, those are some of the big modifications, but then you also have whole sign aspects in addition to degree-based aspects. Um, you have a, a radically different way of understanding houses. They're not affiliated with signs in ancient astrology. So Aries has nothing to do with the first house. Virgo has nothing to do with the sixth house. Libra has nothing to do with the seventh house. For people conceptually shifting your total understanding, not only of what meanings belong to which houses, it's, it's actually a lot more sophisticated than people understand. Like there's many houses for death. There's many houses for sex. There's multiple houses for children. There's multiple houses for money. People don't realize that in modern astrology. And so shifting your understanding of the houses and stripping them away from their relationship to the signs, that's a big one for people. Anyway, there's so many more, but those are some of the distinctions that happen. Um, in addition to a lot of others. So yeah, no, that's really helpful. And uh, yeah, I can say that after taking your course, having a year without stressing about Pluto was very nice and um, <laughs> scary to have to add him in again. But 
uh, one thing going back to the whole sign house system, we have had some like great questions about uh, the limitations maybe of this house system. And for example, somebody gave the example of a friend who has uh, a son, his son is above the mark of the ascendant and hers is below, let's say. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between a 12th house son and a first house son. Yeah. And how that might show up in somebody's life. It feels, um, even though they're both, let's say, in Pisces, having whole sign houses, it feels um, just a bit blunt was, I think, the word that the viewer used. Right. Right. So this case, if I remember it correctly, because I looked at this, you sent me this question in advance. One person had the sun prior to the ascendant, which would technically in Placidus or a modern house system, put their son into the 12th versus this other person who has the sun on the other side of the ascendant and they have the sun in the first house and they're both Pisces and they have radically different personalities. Is that the gist of it? Yes. Okay. So simple explanation. This is why ancient astrology is a lot more sophisticated too, is that whether you have your, the fact that you both have a whole sign first house sun is meaningless. And let me explain why. Because your sun in the first house, whether it's above the ascendant or below the ascendant, can, depending on how many degrees it is, can change the chart from a daytime chart to a nighttime chart, which in ancient astrology is a huge deal. It will take the sun and make it far less potent if it has not yet risen. Um, on the other hand, uh, sometimes it's a little gray. Sometimes it'll be very close to the horizon and this may not matter. Where is Jupiter? If you're both Pisces sun and one is before the ascendant, one's after, uh, where is Jupiter? Because Jupiter's the dispositor. One of you could have a Jupiter in Aries and the other one could have, you know, uh, Jupiter in Cancer. Um, Jupiter is the host for that sun. So you're never, it's not just the sun in the first house. You're never ever reading the sun in the first house on its own. So context is everything. Unless your charts are identical, it's apples and oranges. You can't say, oh, we both have first house suns. We act differently and therefore whole sign houses doesn't work because all you're doing is using one element of a huge range of craft elements that have to be used collectively. Where is Jupiter? It's if, if Jupiter is in the sixth house versus the 12th house, the ninth house versus the second house, that makes a huge deal of a difference too, as well as its sign position. Not only that, but what aspects are being made to the sun from which planets by whole sign and by degree. Not only that, but you know, where was the moon? What phase of the moon was the moon in, right? Where was the ascendant ruler Jupiter again? So most of the time when people see these kinds of things and they go, you know, I feel like whole sign houses isn't accurate. It's like, well, unless you know the complete craft lingo of ancient astrology, you're able to contextualize usually like five to six different factors associated with any one given delineation, you're not at all getting the full picture. And so that comparison will, um, it will, it will fall flat. It won't be, it's like, you know, you only have a teeny little bit of uh, diagnostic criteria to people that seemingly have the same symptoms. You know, you're, you're not going to know how to differentiate why they actually have an underlying very different disease because you, you're, you're bereft of being able to diagnose properly. So that's, it's very similar in ancient astrology in that respect. Yeah, and I see it happen all the time on social media. Somebody will ask an astrologer, okay, so I've got Mars in this sign. Tell me about myself. And the astrologer's like, I can't. You need to show your whole chart because... Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, context is everything in ancient astrology. Um, in modern astrology, uh, you know, many good psychological modern astrologers would say the same thing. So it's not completely unique mm -hmm. to ancient astrology, but it, it is to say that like you never, nothing exists in a vacuum in your chart when people are like my Mars, first of all, it's not your Mars, it's a God, right? And it's, it's, it is, it is administrating a portion of your karma. So when you look at a, when, when we use this possessive language, one of the reasons that we end up, we end up having struggling with ancient astrology is because it strips back our conflation uh, of our identity with the chart. And it says like, you're not your chart. The chart is just a diagnostic karmic language that's describing elements of who you are, what you will experience and so forth. People get overly identified with that because they want the chart to say something good about them or they want the chart to help increase something about their happiness. But ancient astrology was not about that. Ancient astrology was about recognizing that your indwelling 
spirit soul is the source of your happiness and not what your chart says about you. In fact, it's the complete opposite in ancient astrology. It's like your chart is there to help you understand all the stuff you're going to go through that could tempt you into thinking that you're something other than what you are, which is an eternal, you know, spirit. Yeah. Your chart is everything you're not. <laughs> yeah. It's almost entirely that. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to make people feel like there's nothing good to be gained from a chart. There's so much that can be used for positive you know, feeling better about ourselves if we have low self-esteem. The chart can be wonderful for that, but the chart is not, you, you know, the ch in many ways, it's like the chart isn't your friend. It would be, it'd be like if you're born into a new field of karma and someone gave you a printout of that field of karma and you just started hugging it. You're like, oh my gosh, you know, like this field of karma. It's like, dude, not the point. We're here to navigate through this field of karma. So knowledge about this field is there to help you so that you don't get lost and, and when, when do we get lost? We get lost when we think, well, what's going to happen with my bank account this year? That's what determines my happiness. Or what's going to happen in my love life? That's what determines my happiness. Knowing about this stuff is specifically there to help us get off the wheel of time, get off you know, the, the samsaric wheel. So we don't want to identify with the birth chart in that respect. But that doesn't mean we can't, you know, we can't have fun with it either. Yeah, and I think you're getting at something which is another question that lots of people have, which is what is the difference between um, getting a reading from a Hellenistic traditional astrologer and getting a reading from somebody who's practicing more modern astrology? Right. Well, and I mean, no disrespect to modern astrologers because I've had many modern astrology readings and some of them have been really, really great. Um, I think of masters like Richard Tarnas, Liz Green, so many others um, who practice forms that are different from my own, who I still, I, I feel like have changed my life, you know, so um, all, all respect. Um, but I would say in general, the thing that you'll get in a modern psychological reading is going to be the chart is being used in a sense like a Myers-Briggs, but it's a lot more elaborate and in some ways a lot more deep. And it will help you understand different aspects or facets of your behavior, your psyche, you know, like that. And um, that's, that's great. Ancient astrology, I feel like um, personally, I think it's, I, I will say, I'm not going to hide it, that I think it is superior in some ways because it can do that and more. One of the things that modern astrologers tend to do is to shy away from prediction. Ancient, astrologer, ancient astrology is much more of a karmic science. It, the, the underlying philosophy is that you're a transmigrating soul who is in some ways um, trapped in avidya, meaning a delusional sense of being the body when you're actually an eternal being. Um, and the spiritual path is one of evolving to a higher spiritual world, let's say. That's very clear in ancient astrology. And so um, Ancient astrology needs to be able to, as the soul goes from body to body, the consequences of previous choices are spilling over into this lifetime, creating our destiny or our fate or our, our karma. And so we need to be able to say, you're born with certain kinds of karma fructifying in this lifetime because of previous choices and momentum that the soul carries with it. Here's what that looks like. Here's what areas of life it is, it is happening in, and here's when it's going to happen. An ancient astrologer is going to be able to say something more like that. For example, I saw an Indian astrologer, much more predictive. Indian astrology is also very ancient in this respect, very predictive. And it said, you know, in this month of 2020, your wife is going to have a, a skin issue that she deals with and maybe a surgery. And I, that really scared me. Well, she had a mole removed, you know, and it was so interesting the way it came up. Or I, I've said this before as well, which is like, you know, I knew for weeks that my daughter had a difficult transit in her chart that was likely to result in her getting sick. Uh, I was really worried about it as a dad, you know, understandably. Well, she got like a, a, a little UTI. And um, so she had to go on some antibiotics. Um, you know, I can tell you that the process of dealing with the anxiety, of seeing the planets play out, and of living through that experience confirmed within me that karma is real. And what that does is it places the impetus on us to improve our karma. Karma yoga, what does that mean? Do good things because the consequences karmically are real and they're always teaching us. So that's not to say be afraid. It's to say your actions really do matter and you can see it when you see karma play out in your life predictably. It's a karmic, we're, we're in a world that has karmic laws. So you know, when we, when we take those seriously through astrology and we get a reading with an ancient astrologer where there's a, a, a good amount of predictive uh, 
um, transits that are being laid out for you. So you know, not always 100% super concrete and specific, but like relationship stuff, a little bit more difficult, maybe involving money between this month and this month, right? That kind of specificity you're going to get a lot more of with an ancient astrologer. But the nice thing is that many ancient astrologers nowadays, because Hellenistic astrology in the modern era is sort of a, a neo practice, it's something that can't help but be wed to different modern psychological forms. I believe that the role of a good Hellenistic or ancient astrologer in the modern world is to also include questions about well, what's happening in your inner life and how can astrology help you to continue exploring that. So that's why I think ancient astrology is sort of better because you can do both things. Whereas a lot of the times modern astrologers who haven't studied ancient astrology don't have the same predictive skill set. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and maybe that brings us on to wrapping up with a question uh, that I've had for a while. Um, does astrology need to evolve? And, you know, I think this is a, even if you're very interested in Hellenistic astrology, you know, we don't want to be dressing up in togas and sacrificing goats. Yeah. So where is astrology at and how do you see it evolving? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's something that um, I, uh, I, I've heard, you know, well, again, a lot of Hellenistic astrologers will say, which is that, you know, some people call it neo-Hellenistic astrology, like neoplatonism. Um, it can't, here's my feeling about this is that um, we can't, help i mean everything you know what does evolve mean it means to unfold the idea in modern times that we're living with that is really really pervasive that doesn't match with the ancient paradigm is that everything is progressing in a linear trajectory into the future meaning we're getting wiser we're getting more intelligent we're getting more spiritually leveled up everything is becoming better more utopian and there's a kind of uh brighter future. So it's futurism. Um, ancient astrology said that um, times of great expansion are followed by times of great contraction, and that the cycle of the universe itself has never had a beginning. It never has an end. That's really hard to wrap our head around, but that it cycles through periods of destruction and rebirth, uh, contraction and expansion. And they believe that this was never ending, and they called it samsara. Just like the seasons go round and winter comes and destroys and spring comes like that. So when we're in an, uh, 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 oftentimes when we're in certain historical moments, we really think, oh, this is new. We're progressing. We're advancing. It's getting so much better. But then as we can quickly see, that's really fragile. Like the coronavirus is teaching us right now. That's actually really, really fragile sense of what progressed means. Technology and civilization as we know it can be toppled very easily by a virus. So um, what is real progress? Well, for ancient astrologers, real progress was not historical because history is infinite and never ending in, in a sense. It's just, it's just cycles of you know, change. Eventually, our solar system will die. The universe itself will die. It will be reborn. None of this will be remembered. And that, that perspective is so important because it cuts away at the hubris of thinking, oh, everything in the past is antiquated and needs to be updated and needs to go forward and get better. At the same time, it can also cut back in the opposite direction from thinking, well, you know, we were at a golden age in the past and now we're in a dark age and it, we have to, you know, get back to the golden age. No, I mean, there's nothing from the standpoint, like it's biblical, there's nothing new under the sun in a sense. But things are, the same things that repeat, repeat in new ways in different times. So the same basic, you know, uh, uh, the eternal dharma, the eternal essence of religious and spiritual truths, recycle and express themselves in different times and ages and periods in different ways. So in that sense, I feel like astrology is at this unique crossroads right now where for the first time in a very long time, we have access to the bulk of Hellenistic source texts since the 1990s, which has spawned this kind of renaissance, bringing ancient astrology back. But if we think that that means we got to go back to a golden age where everything was much more spiritually evolved, that's just as problematic as people being like, we're in the age of Aquarius and astrology now is so much more evolved than it was 2,500 years ago. It's all, you know, when you read Plato, when you read the teachings of Jesus, when you read the teachings of Black Elk, when you, you know, read the yogic, the yoga sutras or the Puranas, the, the, the Dhammapada, all these different sacred texts, the, the Tao Te Ching, they're all saying exactly the same thing in a sense about what's true and real and what kinds of eternal truths we're living with and dealing with. 
So we just need to learn to use astrology to help us pursue, pursue spiritual life uh, in the day and age that we're living in. To me, that doesn't mean that the techniques need to change a whole lot because they're solid. They're really, really good. Um, but it does mean that the way we use astrology needs to change to address the, the, the way in which we're approaching the eternal patterns within our day and age. Um, and that takes, you know, that takes real sensitivity. Um, I think that doesn't come in textbooks. That's, that's part of why astrology is also about living a certain kind of spiritual lifestyle so that we can be really sensitive to, you know, realization, as my guru says, uh, and his guru said as well, realization means knowing how to package eternal truths about spiritual life that, um, that you've realized that have become personal to you, according to the time, place and circumstance that you're dealing with right now. Yeah, and I guess by looking back at what's been and understanding it a bit more, um, we're in a better place to, I guess, integrate it into our current modern lives. Yeah, yeah. For I mean, the funny example that I always give is like some of the ancient language reflects a culture that was much more comfortable with death than we are. So from us, it's like, oh my God, look at how morbid some of the languages. It's like, yeah, but dude, think about the lives that they were living compared to, I mean, we're living like kings compared to what, I mean, our standard of life, my standard of life in a little house in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. is like king compared, I mean, I have air conditioning, I have a refrigerator, you know, I, whatever. So, in, you know, their reality was much more gruesome in a sense, and but also refreshingly closer to some truths that sometimes we have, we've maybe grown too distant from, like the coronavirus is reminding us of that right now. So there's trade-offs and um, the language may need to shift a little bit because sometimes the language of ancient astrology, though the techniques are accurate, is a little jarring for the comforts of modern life. So that, that, that's part of the sensitivity too. Yeah, they've missed a lot of our first world problems. Which yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. I think that's all of my questions for today. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Well, this was really fun. And uh, I would love to hear from all of you. Have you just started uh, studying Hellenistic astrology? Are you brand new to it? Do you have any other questions for us? Please leave them in the comments section. Um, also, uh, tell us about your experiences um, with changing your chart. If you've already looked from whole sign to regular and how it shifted your experience, uh, that would be fun to hear from you guys as well. All right. Until next time, take it easy, everyone. Bye. Bye.